we're going to get to our commentary sections now. So yesterday, obviously, was May Day, May 1st. This is an incredibly important date in the international labor union movement. And this is a time when there are some significant uh, sort of indications of a revived labor spirit in the United States after decades of material and ideological warfare against union organizing. Workers from Amazon, Instacart, Whole Foods, uh, and Target had a sick out yesterday. Many of us supported those strikes uh, in solidarity by not shopping or using any of those platforms, which frankly, I generally try not to use any of those places anyway. Now, at this point, the power of labor is obviously still very limited. We're talking about about 10% of the workforce and disproportionately what remains is in the public sector and not in the private sector. And right now, the incredible importance of the organizing and the courage of a guy like Chris Smalls, who was, of course, fired by Amazon. They claim he was violating social distancing rules, even as he was the one on the shop floor at Amazon demanding that Amazon take basic precautions to protect the health of its workers, which, of course, Amazon blew off. Now, right now, labor is still uh, been so decimated that the best that these efforts can hope for is a sort of PR wins against these predatory companies. Uh, shaming them in public, exposing their hyper exploitative behavior, the fact that none of these places are giving their workers hazard pay, that they're not properly protecting them with hand sanitizers and masks. Um, and those PR battles matter. But ultimately, we recognize the very basic lesson again and again and again, which is that the only way to restrain capitalist behavior is through countervailing liberal power, uh, labor power, not liberal power, <laughs> labor power. This is absolutely the case historically, and it's definitely the case in the kind of hyper monopolized capital that we're in today. And monopoly capital was predicted by, among others, Lenin, who saw the natural trajectory of markets to concentrate wealth in fewer and fewer hands and power in fewer and fewer uh, companies and sectors. In the tech economy, this is an extraordinary new level that opens up um, basically unmediated control of people's not only work, but home and social lives through technology and through frictionless delivery systems. So it's essential that workers organize now and that we recognize that really the only fundamental hope of any type of left politics, whether we're talking about the bare minimum of human decency and reforms that were so incredibly pioneered and publicly articulated by Bernie Sanders, and even more ambitious goals of genuinely democratizing the economy, of understanding that technical innovation is the product of social innovation and that corporations benefit from those social innovations but are not the cause of them. The only way to do that is labor. Now, the barriers are incredibly strong. The barriers, though, are shifting. As Dustin Gostella just pointed out, Gostella just pointed out to me that in no doubt the political and economic barriers are still incredibly strong, going back to, in the latest iteration, the war on labor that really started in the 70s and accelerated in the 80s and have been carried on ever since. We've had Republican administrations viciously attack labor. We've had Democratic administrations do next to nothing for labor and, of course, also tr support trade deals that undermine labor as well. However, as he pointed out to me in a recent conversation on TMBS, the ideological ground is shifting. A lot more people understand that labor is the only thing that will protect them from predatory companies and is the only way to exercise any type of power over wages, protection, and time. And it's also important for all of us on the left to recognize that even as there are numerous movements that play important roles on a variety of issues, that the only structural countervailing force is labor itself. 
and the motivations that come on one hand from a clear and deep self-interest and then on the other the extraordinary solidarity and interdependence that is generated by workers coordinating in that fashion I want to play a clip now from lula da silva who as many people know is a great hero of mine and really an incredible historical figure both for brazil and the world here he is presenting uh talking about may day yesterday from uh, his quarantine, as we all live in this bizarre world together, talking about the significance of May Day and the coronavirus and what it exposes about the nature of capitalism itself. Great tragedies can reveal the true character of people and things. I'm not just talking about the disrespect that the Brazilian president has meted out against the over 5,000 Brazilians who died from coronavirus. The pandemic has also left capitalism naked. It took 300,000 corpuses for humanity to see the truth something we workers have known since the day we were born. The tragedy of the novel coronavirus has exposed an unquestionable fact that is not a capital that sustains capitalism. It is us, the workers. This is an age-old and well-known fact headlined by business newspapers across the world, the Bible of the world elite, that capitalism has its days numbered. They are numbered. It's dying. The task of building this new world once this is over lies in our hands, the hands of the workers. That's 100% right and inspiringly put. Now, there's many possibilities. There's the possibility of greater authoritarianism under capitalism. That is the trend, not only with grotesque leaders like Donald Trump, but even more structurally, companies like Amazon itself. And at the same time, there is unparalleled opportunities for labor to coordinate across boundaries, across states and across countries to reclaim power and generate an actual new world that is democratic, responsive, and in fact, a lot more free. Yeah, I love that. I think that you touched on something that um It's just a message that really needs to resonate with more and more um, working Americans, because I think that this pandemic has really emphasized the amount of power that workers really have if they do coordinate and organize. And not only are people starting to realize that, people who work for these massive corporations uh, that have exploited them and mistreated them for decades now. I mean, keep in mind, someone like Jeff Bezos has profited uh, handsomely through this pandemic. He made $24 billion additional dollars as a result of coronavirus. And at the same time, you know, you have his workers striking because they're not given the bare necessities, just the basics to keep themselves safe, um, including the masks, the gloves, the social distancing, and the hazard pay which they deserve. Now, it's not just workers who are realizing it though, it's also incredibly powerful, wealthy people who have helped to protect this rigged economic system that we're living under. And so if you're paying close attention to some of these cable news interviews that are happening right now, you have people like Leon Cooperman, who was like literally crying about a wealth tax on CNBC <laughs> yep. months ago, now literally. talking about how, yeah, now talking about how capitalism fundamentally needs to change as a result of what's happening right now. So he's calling for higher taxes, for instance. Um, then Mark Cuban is another example. All of a sudden this like uh, boastful libertarian is saying like, oh, we need a federal jobs program. We need to uh, increase wages to $15 an hour. But don't get fooled by their messaging because they're scared. They realize that they're in a vulnerable situation right now because Workers do have power and they're realizing it and they are organizing. Um, and we need to kind of continue that trend and not settle for small concessions or small reforms that we're hearing from these millionaires and billionaires. That's such an important point, Anna. And I, and I think that actually loops with, on one hand, people having a much more sophisticated understanding of the capital class itself. Right. I read the Financial Times basically every day and people, if you want to understand how the world actually works, I would the, the Financial Times is going to give you infinitely more information than the New York Times. Um, you know, of course, obviously be reading Jacobin. But there is always been a contingent 
of the capitalist classes, particularly in Europe, obviously, for a variety of reasons, less so than the United States. But it's starting to change now because of Corona that has definitely understood that, of course, you know, you don't have to steal every single last wedge and that it is, in fact, better for social cohesion. And it's been proven historically. I mean, this is this is obviously a challenge to certain type of revolutionary socialist politics, that if you can give people some basic standards of decency and livability, particularly in the developed world, um, they don't necessarily have a problem uh, with with other aspects of capitalism that are also problems, in fact, right? So, but it's just important to note because I think in our politics, again, we still have this, even amongst people who identify as radical, that, that politics is about morals and personal motivation and who you feel empathy for or not. Now, all of those things are great. That's fine. I actually happen to think, though, that inside serious collective efforts is how you generate the most durable sense of those qualities. But regardless of that, that that politics leads to, like, as an example, false confidence in, oh, look at these capitalists understanding all of a sudden that we should have some nice things for people, right? So even look at the Financial Times. For 10 years, Martin Wolf was writing columns after the Great Recession saying basically that the Western world needs to deal with inequality on some level. Then when Jeremy Corbyn comes along, he, along with the rest of the Financial Times and all the UK press, set about destroying him and any hope of actually enacting an actual agenda. And this is, I think, going to overlap uh, with your awesome commentary that's about to happen. But when we look at politics just as a question of what kind of world we'd like and who sh we should be looking out for and what is and isn't right, in a way we actually reinforce the same assumptions that are embedded in a liberal and capitalist order. And when we reframe it as power needs to actually be really fundamentally restructured so that it works for the many, not the few, then the engine clearly goes through mass labor and not either the social conscience of plutocrats or the sort of like liberal sympathies of professional class people. It is a fundamental reframe in how you do politics. And this is another reason why, you know, Marx is important to read. Definitely. And, you know, just a, a, a recent example of someone who was applauded as a, as a capitalist who was doing right by his workers. And then now it turns out that's not the case. You know, the CEO of uh, Costco. Costco has had, I don't even know how many news stories written about it, how many profiles written about how it it pays its workers fairly and it's, you know, incredibly competitive wages, great benefits, you know, all of this positive press to kind of do the pro, you know, capitalism marketing that we've been used to for so long. And then yesterday, a uh, story broke about how they've really loosened the social distancing um, guidelines within these stores. So workers are concerned, you know, they're also thinking about striking or doing something about this because they don't feel safe. Uh, they don't feel like the management is really looking out for their best interests. So you're right. I, I think that it always comes from the workers organizing and demanding more because they do have the power. They're the ones who make these companies run. They're the ones who produce these products. They're the ones who make things happen. And I really appreciated a conversation that you had on your show recently on TMBS with uh, Yolian um, Ogbu, I hope I'm saying her name correctly. But she was talking I'm about how her mom- i not with. <laughs> well, she's the one who was uh, talking about how her mother, who's like a healthcare yes. worker, um, you know, was kind of sick of how healthcare workers had been treated at this particular clinic. And so she just decided, I'm not going to show up to work. Other healthcare workers at this place decided not to show up. And they made management bend to their will because they had the power. It got to the point they demanded hazard pay, which <sighs> hazard pay should be like non-negotiable. It should be there when you're, you know, on the front lines during this pandemic. Uh, but she's like, no, I'm not going to show up until I get that hazard pay. And finally, management uh, conceded to what the workers wanted. So that power is there. We just need to organize and, and exercise it. 
And that's where um, the only and the only place where the power really is outside of the capitalist class is people's labor. And that is the core strategic insight. 